What's going on guys? Your boy Terabyte Reacts here and I am back very much so. Um so let me give you guys an update on this video before I get it started. I made a channel update video. Um I think it was yesterday. Um so you guys can go check that out if you want to know what is going on, what was the great news and stuff like that. Um give some very important updates in that. Um and going forward, what's going to happen with the channel, as I always do. Okay, so one of the things I talked about Game of Thrones, that this is about to be a Game of Thrones reaction. Um, going forward, we're going to be doing Game of Thrones stuff, but it's not going to be on the schedule. But I am going to be doing Game of Thrones. I'm not um, going to stop doing them. But whenever I can, I will be doing Game of Thrones until the premiere of the new season. Um, where we can ramp things up back again and it becomes a priority on the channel for right now It's just I'm just gonna upload Game of Thrones whenever I can so um, I'm still gonna stick with the content all your suggestions are still on the list for me to get to so don't worry about it It's still there. I'm still Gonna react to you to your suggestions and all that stuff if you still have more links that you want me to react to don't hesitate to send them to me because they're on the list and I'm planning to do them whenever I can because they are days when I'm not going to have anything to react to. Um, and those days are more than likely going to be the days when I do Game of Thrones stuff. Um, just in between everything, but everything else is going to be on a schedule that's on the channel. Okay, so today we are going to react to some more Game of Thrones stuff. Okay, and this one is a 30 minute video as I told you guys before that's the reason why I've been holding off Because there's such long ones that are left all the long ones are left now pretty much I don't have any any more short stuff to react to everything is like 20 to 30 minutes up to even one hour Left on this list. So I left them for last. Okay, so I still have the rest of the histories and lore videos to do I think it's part three to like part six which are some of them are like hour 20 minutes like a movie You know, what I'm it's, like, it's like a movie watching a movie. So This one here was suggested um, of course, a while back, a while back, I want to say like a month ago, this one was suggested. Um, this is the top 10 best and worst changes from the books done by Nerd Soup. Okay, you guys know that I did a lot. I did a couple of Nerd Soup videos um, on the channel so far. I love their format, their animated format that they do on their YouTube channel. So, Let's hear what they have to say. Obviously, these guys have they have read the books, they have watched the show, so they're just gonna be kicking it, talking about um, the best and worst changes from the books. Um, so that will educate me also because I have not read the books; I've only watched the TV series. So let's jump into it, man. No further ado. This boy, Nerd Soup. And I don't know what the other guy's name. <laughs> I um I know the main guy is Nerd Suit. The guy the sister looks. I don't know if that's supposed to be a beer or whatever. Um I don't know who he is. Uh, okay, so let's jump into it. Game of Thrones best and worst changes from the books. Now you haven't read the books, right? I read the books twice before you picked one up. All right, relax. How many times? Twice. Twice through. Yeah. Okay. Well, you, then you're a nerd. Nerd Suit. <laughs> so best and worst changes well i mean this is all over the internet people complaining about the changes yeah i'm very indifferent with a lot of the changes unless it's like dramatic but some of the stuff it's just logical to change or to have an adjustment I, I, i'm not like a nitpicker like where it's like one little change i'm not gonna go crazy that like i'm uh, the same way i mean yeah. it's just it is what it is the books are the books the show is the show but they couldn't have included Renly's peach. Oh. You can't give a brother a peach. <laughs> you say he rides into battle on the back of a giant dire wolf. They say he can turn into a wolf himself when he wants. They say he can't be killed. Do you believe them? No, my lord. Anyone can be killed. I would say my second, this is probably my second favorite change from the books, Arya and Tywin, their conversations. 
these scenes are incredible between these two characters. It's just so great to see a young, great actress like Maisie Williams with the old veteran Charles Dance. To compete with him, to and just keep the up with him. And the characters, too. Like they're, both fan- they're both great, but like the characters they play are so great, too. They're very similar characters, in a way. Yeah, they are. Tywin even says, you know, you remind me of my daughter, but think- better. <laughs> and in my opinion, I think when Arya goes to Harrenhal in the books, it's kind of a mess. I would say even the Jack and Hagar storyline in Season 2 is better than the books. It was such a great change to change it from her interactions with Roose Bolton to Tywin because you have the conversation of where they're talking about their fathers. She tells Tywin, my father died from loyalty. Tywin asks her, what do you think about Rob Stark? Do you believe the rumors that he can't die? And she says, no, everybody can die. And she grills him. She's grilled cheese in him. And he's like, and I love the part when he tells her the story about King Harren. King Harren built a castle that can withstand a march from a million men. And then Aegon just came through with the dragons and burnt it all down. A million men could have marched on these walls and a million men would have been repelled. But an attack from the air with dragon fire, no. Harren and all his sons roasted alive within these walls. And Arya's even spitting, like, hey, don't forget about the sisters, Visenya and Rhaenys. And Tywin's like, oh yeah, I'm sure I remembered that. I also think she's the only character in Game of Thrones who ever made Tywin Lannister laugh. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably Most girls true. more interested in the pretty maidens from the songs. John Keel, flowers in her hair. Most girls are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you kind of see like she kind of grown up in a way because when we know Arya, she was still like the youngest daughter of Ned. She's still young, but we see him talking like grown ups like that, like on their level, and then it makes sense how she would be able to be such a survivor going forward. You think she's the smartest Stark? She's probably the most resourceful. Uh, yeah, um, so I'm going to be giving my opinion on these, of course, um, of them talking about the changes, because the changes are in the show from the books. Um, so my opinion on, on Arya, you guys know she's definitely in my top five characters in the show. Um, Arya's character is a very interesting character that I, I really, I love and adore her character because the growth of her, um, and the reason, the, the, um, the reason why is that they talk about the conversations that is, they specifically talked about those conversations with Tywin was very, very interesting. We got, um, I, I think the first time we got a inside look into how how she thinks when she was having those conversations. The first time we, we kind of understood or tried to understood Arya from her perspective and what she was going through as a survivor in the show and her being the start. Now, her being the smartest Stark, I don't know about that. I think that title goes to, um, I think that title goes to Sansa. And the reason why I say Sansa is the smartest Stark, the reason why is because she doesn't have the the fighting skills. You get what I'm saying? Like, she has always had to use her brain thereafter. After growing up a little bit and stop being the, 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 the girl who's been picked on and put in situations where she couldn't handle certain things, when she grew up, she became the smartest Stark. Even now, I still believe that she's smarter than John. John is just... You know what I'm saying? Like John is, is he can lead. He's a leader. He's smart, but also he makes dumb decisions. Um, he won't, um, he won't, uh, he, he's the type of person like this, like his integrity is everything to him and is what he's been, what he was taught by, you know, is, his father at the time which is Ned is what he's been taught is what he's grown up to to learn from Ned being so honorable and to to um to be to his word and and not stray from his word and if he does it must be because of something that's one of the things that John never learned from Ned is to to be so um to be honorable but to understand that um if push comes to shove you know what I'm saying? If you got to save somebody's life and, and a lie would do that, you have to do it. But for John is <laughs> for John. I don't think John would do that. I really, I, I don't, I don't think he would. 
um, because, you know, what he said in season seven when after, you know, we all think it was the dumbest decision ever when he decided to tell Cersei that he's already sworn fealty to um, to Daenerys, you know, when he said that, you know, little lies turn into big lies and then nobody's word mean anything anymore. I'm paraphrasing, of course, but it's just what I'm saying, man. It's just such an awesome feeling to to know that I, I, I don't think that she's the smartest star. I think Sansa has that title because if it wasn't for her, John would have never survived the Battle of the Bastards if it wasn't for her. She was smart, but she should have said something. She should have told John that she was going to get Littlefinger, that she wrote that letter. I, I don't know why she lied about that. It made no sense to me. Maybe you guys get a better sense of what that meant or why she didn't tell him the truth or why he didn't, not necessarily the truth, but why she didn't tell him that, hey, I can get Littlefinger to get the veil here. Um, and that's what I'm going to do so that we can have more men. I know, I know Littlefinger will come through for me, you know, and she never did that. She never said anything to him. As a matter of fact, she lied. And that's the reason why Brienne had asked her, like, why did you lie? That, it, uh, you know, it, it just didn't make sense. You know, according to the plot and how everything was going, there was no reason for her to hide it. Or maybe you guys picked up on something that I didn't pick up on. You can tell me in the comment section, okay? So, Arya, I do believe that she has some real, as we would call it, some fire conversations with Tywin, right? She did. So, uh, and it really introduced us so much more into her character, even though they were already showing you that she's a survivor, you know, but she was basically being, still being taken care of and not being, you know, she was very brave. She, um, she didn't see her father die, but she was there when she died and all of that stuff. So to see her grow up to be the type of person that she is in season seven, it was a, a great journey to see. So that was an awesome change if it was so different in the book. You get what I'm saying? Like maybe um, they were saying that it, they changed it from Roos because she had those conversations with Roos Bolton. I don't, instead of Tywin, I think that was a great change in my opinion. If if it was Roos, Roos would have been, he, he's a great character, don't get me wrong, but and he had some really good conversation too. Who knows? Who knows? It might have been a better thing. It might have been a better thing if they went along with what happened in the books. But that was great. All in all, it was still great. You know, I think those conversations were were awesome. But who are we? Okay, the fate militant. We have no names, no family. Every one of us is poor and powerless. And yet together... We can overthrow an empire. Mm. Well, the Sparrows, like, in the books, they're great, too. But I, I, I never felt when I was reading it, when you're reading Cersei's chapters, you still, like, it's still Cersei to you. In the show, they make her out to be her own protagonist, where you're rooting for her in her own subplot, and it's just amazing writing. It's also the benefit of watching these characters on film rather than just seeing them from Cersei's perspective. Like you said, it's still a Cersei chapter. But these characters in the show, they almost take over the whole damn kingdom. And one thing about them is that they're so damn hateable that they made the fans root for Cersei. Yeah. That they made the High Sparrow, he's such a prick, he's so condescending, but he acts like he's so innocent. I like and that too, how they were able to take, I think this goes with it more than like a separate change, there's Tommen being older. You're able to see him um, manipulate him, he's not a young boy where... He's not sitting around playing with Sir Pounce, which maybe we could have got a couple more scenes of that. Right, yeah, <laughs> need more Sir Pounce. But, That's uh, going to be in the worst changes. <laughs> <laughs> but the manipulation of the High Sparrow to Tommen, where you absolutely... There were points where I hated Tommen more than Joffrey, which is in right. incredible. Right, wanted Joffrey to come back and just kill these guys. Yeah, I'm like, where's Joffrey? I need Joffrey to come <laughs> wipe these guys out. I'm like, I hated Tommen. Just yes, it, I totally agree with that sentiment. I think at one point in my reactions, I was saying, where's Joffrey, man? You know Joffrey would have came in with the hammer a long time ago. All these dudes would have been dead. J Joffrey would have came in. My queen? Bruh. Mark, you took my my mom. You know he would he would have killed everybody the minute they took the mom. Like maybe he wouldn't be like 
kill them all for the queen because maybe Cersei would have been able to tell him that, listen, this is all my plan. Don't worry about it. Okay? But Joffrey, once they took the moms, mm-mm, mm-mm. No, bruh. Everybody did. Everybody did. <laughs> you know Joffrey would have came in with a hammer real quick. In such a different way, you know? Yeah, the way they manipulated him to make him become so pious, to become the pious king. And to be fair, we don't know how it's going to end in the books, but I think what we have compared to the books, this yes. was a And a John, Jonathan Price, too. Absolutely oh, incredible. Yeah, so good. The only other yeah. thing I remember him from is Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> nah. He's Kira Knightley's dad. Nah, bro. Don't you I know him from a lot Where's of different Can we bring TV shows and stuff that he's been in, too. I wish we had some wine for you. It's a bit early in the day for us. Marjorie is another character that in the books you don't see the story from her perspective. There's rumors about how she's seductive. She's kind of a femme fatale character. But in the show, you see, she was only the only one to really rein in Joffrey. The way that she was able to manipulate Joffrey and then manipulate Tommen. This was one of my favorite characters in the show, and I was really sad when she was killed off. Yeah, you really saw her come, uh, come into her own. You're not just seeing it through Cersei's eyes. So of course, you just think, oh, Cersei just hates her because she feels threatened by her. What she does in the show, but you don't see it from Marjorie's. You don't like, get to see what Marjorie's actually doing and planning. Like her talks with Olena. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, some of the best scenes. Olena, too, in the, yeah, in the show. I think you could really put both of them in there. They're just the way they, they're planning. They're, they're, based, they're playing the game, too. I mean, oh, everyone they're, sees, and they're two of the best players. You see Littlefinger, Varys, and uh, Tyrion, but they're playing the game just as much as anyone. They're setting their family up as well. Once Joffrey gets, well, first Renly, then Joffrey, and then Tommen. They make a lot of smart moves. Yeah. And I think some of the best scenes are is with Elena sparring with some of the major players. The first scene that she has with Varys, it's the only time where Varys isn't getting the last word in this conversation. She's She makes Varys bite his tongue. Same thing with Tywin. I don't care what people believe. And neither do you. As an authority on myself, I must disagree. Same thing with Littlefinger, and of course, she owns Cersei in every scene. We need each other. <laughs> I wonder if you're the worst person I've ever met. At a certain age, it's hard to recall. But the truly vile do stand out through the years. And the scene with the Sand Snakes in season six, yeah. it's like, you look like an angry little boy. Shut up. <laughs> Are we just changing this? <laughs> yeah, to, uh, I think I think Elena was the better change. <laughs> oh, really, Bron? You don't fight with honor. No. I fight to win. He did. <laughs> I mean, he the Bronn and Tyrion <laughs> stuff made me really like Tyrion even more. I remember in the first season, I wasn't really sure how I felt about Tyrion. You know, I'm new to the character, I'm new to the show, Lannisters aren't supposed to be... It sets you up where you're not supposed to root for the Lannisters, but his back and forth for Bronn, it just... Right off the bat, these two actors had great chemistry. And I think that's... In the books, he's kind of just disappeared after Tyrion is accused of Joffrey's murder. But in the show, they liked him so much that they paired him with Jamie. Even though that season is controversial for the Jamie and Bronn storyline, Bronn is still one of the best parts of the show. He's funny. He's a great swordsman. He's got a great voice. Brother, oh brother. Yeah, he kills that. Rips, rips it. One of my favorite scenes. It's the benefit of doing it on film where you get to explore this character more because he's not going to be a point of view character. Yeah, he's well, a sellsword. Yeah, I think it was his name is Wilco Johnson who played Ill Payne. Right. Unfortunately, he passed away, so they couldn't have that aspect of Jamie training with Ill Payne like he does in the books. It was this great idea idea to put Bronn into that character right, and help yes. him get his left hand back. Because those those scenes are funny that he just kind of crackles at him. He doesn't want anyone to tell. Yeah, right. right. It's kind of funny to do a jab with Bronn. Like, it's like, don't tell anyone. It's like, oh, well, you pay too good. Like, Yeah, yeah, right. And there's an awesome scene in the books, though, because he kind of does disappear, and that's something I don't like, but he names his wife's bastard son Tyrion right after Tyrion gets accused of all that, and it just drives Cersei crazy. And it's, it's so funny. <laughs> He's such a troll. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's amazing. And those actors hate each other in real life. Oh, yeah, I heard that. Yeah, Does loyalty mean nothing to, to you? They, I think they were it means everything to me. And yet here you stand. And yet here I stand. I've sure seen a lot of people too? mention that Jorah is better in the show because 
I think he kind of goes under the radar. But for me, the way I read Jorah in the books, he was kind of this sulking, brooding, uncharismatic character. He was kind of perverted, too, the way he comes on to Daenerys. He's very charismatic in the show. He's charming. He's a great swordsman. He's one of the most complex characters, even from the stuff that we don't see, all the stuff with his wife, to where he ends up in the beginning of Game of Thrones. I think he's a much better character in the show. A lot of it comes down to, like, on screen, it just makes everything better. And I think that uh, Ian Glenn does a great job with the character as well. Much more handsome in the show. Like, you actually like oh come on Daenerys give my man a shot <laughs> I mean, yeah in the, in the books nah, he's right. more described as <laughs> he is like he takes on his sigil the bear big hairy brooding guy balding I think his chemistry with Daenerys is better on screen with Amelia Clark when they castrated you did they take the pillow with the stones I've always wondered have you do you spend a lot of time wondering what's between my legs I mean, we've <laughs> talked about this on several occasions the scenes between <laughs> Littlefinger and Varys are just Gripping. Probably the best written scenes, I would argue, in the entire show. Because you really get what Game of Thrones is about with these two characters, especially since they've changed Varys in the show. But the quips, the wittiness, uh, the intelligence, it's all on display when these two characters are in the same scene. And the actors who portray them, Aidan Gillen and Conleth Hill, incredible. Both Irish. They're both kind of perfect for the roles, if you think oh, about it. Oh, they're both it. Irish? Perfect casting. Yeah, their conversations, it just adds so much to their background where... You, and it doesn't really give much away. It's it would very be, subtle. It's very... It makes you makes you think more. And you wouldn't see this in the books because it would be impossible, more so Varys than Littlefinger, to have a point of view chapter for these characters because it would spoil so many things. If you got a Littlefinger point of view chapter in book one, all those surprises from Feast for Crows or Storm of Swords would be ruined. So it's great that we get to see these characters interact. But you could see that there's a little rivalry in the books, but it's on full display in the show. Do you, Max, have a phantom cock? Next time you think about naked girls. Oh, this is the worst finish. change? Oh, okay. The oh, genius are best of Game changes, of Thrones okay. is that they introduced a villain that was as hated and evil as Joffrey, and then he became one of the most iconic villains of all time. He dies, and in the same season they introduce a villain who's probably more hated and more iconic than Joffrey. In a matter of a year, he usurped Joffrey as the most hated villain on TV. I mean, Joffrey, you always got the sense, like, you know how, like, troubled and sick he was, but he would let other people do his things for him. He's more of a sociopath. Yes, but, yeah. like, Ramsey's a psychopath. Ramsey, he yeah. was in the dungeons. Just <laughs> I did say that. It, it, the, it, um, I, I re- said oh, that. Reek, sorry. I'm re- it, when I was just, reacting. It was, it was pretty brutal to watch, and you don't get that in the books. It's hinted at. You see it. You, you get Theon, and uh, he's already Reek. He's yes. gray hair. He's, you get to see the, the transition into right. the, the Reek character. And it's brutal. Oh my god! And but the thing is too, Ramsey like he's still like a, like he's still like a psychopath, piece of shit, bad guy in the books. But we get to see more of him in the show. I mean, it's kind of weird like saying we get to see more of that stuff is good, but it, the way he does it, he's so much more clever. He's a better fighter in the books, and he, it adds more to the villain character. In uh, the books, he's just more of just, just a psychopath that loves to torture people. And he's not as major as he is in the show. By season no. six, he's the biggest villain. In yes, the show. he's still like a psychopath and all that. He's more ambitious. He's more. He has a plan. He's smarter. He's more clever. Yes, he's you a, know, he's playing his own game in, in a way. That's probably the biggest difference between him and Joffrey is that Ramsay knows what he's doing. Joffrey is a little whiny bitch. The, the other difference is that I know people <laughs> who like Ramsay. There, there was a small section of Game of Thrones fans who actually enjoyed the character. He was almost like the Joker of Game of Thrones. Yeah. The difference with Ramsay is that he's actually killing and hurting people that we love. He added to the story rather than just having all this senseless, it made you hate him more. And that's, that's good when you want to watch like a show. You yeah. want someone to root for. Right. Root against. Yeah, well, hold on. <laughs> I always wanted some Valerian steel. Come with me, Arya. I'll take you to safety. Safety? Where the fuck's that? Her auntie Neri's dead. Her mother's dead. Her father's dead. Her brother's dead. Winterfell is a <laughs> pile of rubble. There's no safety, you dumb bitch. Damn. <laughs> you don't know that by now. You're the wrong one to watch over her. Brienne in the show is someone that had her ups and downs, I would say, throughout the series, but I think one of the strong points of season four and Brienne's arc post Jamie was the showdown with her and the Hound. It's similar to the books where after you talk about the post Jamie arc where she's given the sword and Jamie tasks her with finding the Stark girls. The showdown between her and the Hound, and first of all, the, the speech that the Hound gives to her about Arya that there's nowhere to hide, and then they just duke it out yeah, it was dirty it was grimy there was cheap shots there was you know it was like the, the old hound <laughs> grabbing the sword and oh my it was, oh that was such a great scene 
It was like those old cartoon scrummages when it's like the ball and everybody's fighting. You know <laughs> what I'm talking about? Yeah. And then it turns out that the hound comes back and he survives. But, you know, you got to give Brienne some credit. She took down one of the best fighters in the show. It adds to it because he's changed too, the hound. He sees a different man when you see him for like a scene. <laughs> and then he goes back to grabbing the axe. And <laughs> right, yeah. He changed for like those 20 minutes. <laughs> How many times have we seen in this book? Twice, I think? The opening scene and, uh... And then Crasser's son. The way that they've handled them in the show, they've made them so mysterious, so evil, and I think the Night's King himself is the best villain that the show has ever done, and he's been in, like, three episodes. But they're so mysterious, and they're so evil, and, and you know that they're lurking behind the shadows, and they haven't fully exposed the threat yet, but I think in the show they've handled them better, because we've seen these, these momentary glimpses of the true power of the White Walkers. I agree that like when you see less of something, it, be- it adds to it more. But I think in the book, it's it's too much it's less. Too, yes, <laughs> it's too less. You get you get like I said, you only seen him a handful of times in the show. But even the times, every time you see him, it's like a jaw dropping. Oh it's my like, god! Oh, moment sh- when the scene with yeah. Sam. Yeah. Yeah, every t- every time they're on the screen, they absolutely just just waiting here on the edge of your seat. You want to see what's going on because you want to like, oh, we're finally seeing them. Let's see what, they, what they're doing. Can we like finally get some more of it? They tease it just a little, tease it, tease it, tease it, and it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Like the mystery surrounding them. Right, and when that showdown happens, the Song of Ice and Fire, Dragons vs. Walkers, it's going to be that much better because we've been patient and we've waited. They're going to deliver because how can't they? Oh, this happened in the book already? Oh, yes, it must have because it guy said that Don is dead in the books. My favorite episode that the show has ever done, Hard Home to Me. In the books, it's hinted at that there's this fight between the Night's Watch and the White Walkers, but in the show, we get to see it. And the moment when Jon Snow is fighting the White Walker, one of the four horsemen, and he picks up that Valyrian steel sword, he picks up Longclaw, and it clanks against the the White Walker's spear. Chills. Just chills thinking about it right now. It's the best moment the show has ever delivered. It's incredible. Like, I remember when I was watching it and he grabbed that. I'm like, no, no, what are you doing? I thought he was going to die the whole time. I'm like, this is it. This is where Jon dies. And then when he survived, I'm like, he's never going to die. And then he died. Like, two <laughs> oh, no. When he, when he stops that blow, it's, I was going, let's fuck you. Like, I was going crazy. And then he comes, hits him right there. Because... The look on the White Walker's face, too. Yeah, he was shocked. <laughs> Just the whole, yeah. the whole episode. I, I, was, a great I was like, moment, but what? Build up to everything. The we conflict got, between the Watch and the Wildlings. You know, come south of the Wall. We need to fight these guys Tormin together. beating the crap out of the Slord of Bones. And yeah, then right. vouching for John to everybody. The speech that John gives. I got to go back and the check my reaction to that. Because... <laughs> the dead come with it. No clan can stop them. The Free Folk can't stop them, the Night's Watch can't stop them, and all the Southern Kings can't stop them. Only together. All of us. And even then it may not be enough, but at least we'll give the fuckers a fight. Gets me hype every time I hear it. Then it just gets dark and the snow comes and it's cold. The dogs are barking. What might be a better moment is when the Night's King finally reveals himself. When he walks on that dock and he's grilling Jon Snow and he slowly raises his hands and all I, those motherfuckers wake up. Chills thinking about I it. I thought it, he was going to like terrifying scenes part the Red Sea history. like and Moses. <laughs> one small moment. No, there's no jump scares. There's no music playing. Everything's just quiet. Oh. All you hear is the footsteps of the Night's King. The two best moments that the show has ever done. You can literally just put that on whenever you want. And no matter how many times you watch it, it's just always just as good. And the look that Jon Snow and the Night's King share, that they're staring at each other other like it's gonna end with either one of us alive and hopefully the night's king doesn't get the high ground oh, can't help yourself coming up with this list i think this was the first thing that immediately just jumped into my mind we had to talk about it just dorn i'm not just saying like one part of dorn one person i'm just saying dorn in general the only good thing about dorn is Oberyn. it's like like i said i don't mind changes but when you Same miss thing this, I said. basically exclude a whole set and of characters and a plot that would have this ed- is not a this is not a book versus tv series kind of thing it's just that it's just it's just terrible like overall i'm never freaking um i've never read the books i've never read the books of uh, my opinion on dorn just as a whole like 
um, not being a book reader and only um, a TV series watcher, my opinion on Doran was like, it was unnecessary. We could have just had Oberyn death and and pretty much skipped everything else and I would have been fine. Their characters just didn't mean anything after that. And that's just what I'm saying. It's like they were just there to be later on captured by Cersei. But them, them killing the king over. I was like, what is this about? Like, what is it about? Like, the, the story didn't develop enough about Dorne. Like, I didn't get it. You get what I'm saying? Like, the revenge thing, I just didn't understand. Like, why are you taking revenge when Oberyn enter into a legitimate battle and lost. He did. I can understand it's your husband, lover, whatever the situation is. You want revenge. Why kill Oberyn's brother? Like, that didn't make any damn sense to me. Like, why kill Oberyn's brother, um, Doran, the, 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 the king or whatever, of, you know, the, the, the other prince, right? Why kill him? And then call him weak. And it, it just didn't make sense to me. Like the whole storyline. It just didn't make sense. That part of the storyline just didn't make sense to me. Them killing Doran. Um, oh, what's her name again? I don't. I can't. Uh, Laria. I think her name was. Um, or Alyssa. I don't, I don't remember her name. It was some E name. Uh, if I remember correctly. Because they're so. They're such forgettable characters too. It's. Because th there was no time spent on developing that side of it. It's like they were just in the story for for um, for them to create the alliance with Daenerys and then be captured by Cersei. You get what I'm saying? Like, there was nothing else. There was no connection with their characters. You understand what I'm saying? It's like, you know when they just introduce characters into a show because you know you're going to write them off? And I think a lot of people are saying that it's fan service because they realize that when they kill them off, when they get when they got captured and stuff like um, they were saying that that's what D&D &D was up to, you know, like they were giving them fan service because they know they messed up the, the, the storyline, like because so many people is angry about it. Um, but that's just book readers. You know, just me as a TV series, like watching TV series for all these years. And I've never seen such meaningless characters like and the story just didn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't see people. Why would you kill Oberyn's brother? Like, I just didn't get that. Like you could have because he didn't want to take revenge. Um, Your reasoning is stupid. Why kill the man? You understand what I'm saying? Like. It just didn't make sense to me. Like, you're going to kill him because he de he's decided not to avenge Oberyn because Oberyn legitimately entered the fight. This is, he, he made a decision to fight for Tyrion and lost. Got his head smashed like a watermelon. I hated it. I didn't like it one bit. Um, but as I explained after my reaction to that, I explained quite exquisitely, if I might had, that it's... He legitimately entered the fight. So I can't be angry at the mountain. I can't be angry at Cersei. I can't be angry at anybody but Oberyn. Because he entered the fight. Got cocky. Want, crying out for answers about his sister. Wanting them to admit to it. He got tripped. He had the mountain. He should have just killed the mountain. But no. I need answers. And... We all know the, the end of that story, but in the end, I just, I just didn't understand. Like I, I get it. I get that Jamie had to go there and, and, and get his, um, Mar Marcella. I get all of that stuff. I get all of that. The other stuff, the, the killing of Doran just didn't make sense to me. It, that's the whole thing that threw off everything for me for that storyline. And then it was just like, whatever. Okay. They're teamed up with Daenerys. Okay, they got they got captured. I felt nothing when when um when when Euron Euron is that's his name, right? Was was um 
was absolutely smashing their heads in. Like I felt nothing for them. And every character in Game of Thrones that have been introduced and that had major screen time, I've had some sort of connection with them. Oberyn immediately had an imprint on me. Immediately. You're talking about Barriss and Selmy. You're talking about Tyrion. You're talking about Cersei. You're talking about Jaime. Every person that had major screen time, they had major screen time for basically all of that season. And I felt nothing when, when things were happening to them. It was like, okay, I guess this is what they were here for. You know what I'm saying? I was just, I, it, the only thing it that surprised me was what you Euron was just a beast you know what i'm saying when he was taking when he was taking them out like look like a a rabid dog you know so i mean it's crazy the Dorn storyline man it's it's just and i i get it i totally i'm not siding with the book readers cuz i've never read the books i don't know what it's like in the book you guys the people who have read the book they have told me that the Dorn storyline is such a beautiful storyline in the books so I can understand like off bat, just the first thing you want to get out of the way because it was just a terrible, terrible change, terrible change. Added to the show. It just seems like a missed opportunity. The Ariane storyline is completely disregarded. The Dornish master plan. That's yeah. so, it gives Doran so much more depth and character development and heads to him so much. QX is just a book show. Where, uh, who's, who's Doran? Oh, remember that guy in the wheelchair who got stabbed? Oh, that guy sucked. In the books, they kind of build him up like, oh, he sucks too. He has no idea what he's doing. Then it's finally revealed that he has this grand master plan to support the Targaryens, that he sends his oldest son, Quentin, to Marine to meet Daenerys and say, let's wow. form an alliance. Let's take the Seven Kingdoms together. That's why I say the show should have been expanded to 20 episodes, because Dorn could have been a, a show by itself. Well, they could All have the added, politicking. They could have added another season. Like, and the Sand Snakes suck. Oh, my God. It's They're just, so annoying. It's too much. I mean, we like, all right, Oberyn's uh, Bastard Daughters. Okay, that's cool. And it is cool in the books, um, but it's just Mr. It, Mark. It just doesn't work. I love to see the Sand Snakes, their plot to get uh, Marcella, crown her, and then Arianne. All the plotting, all the scheming. They're playing their own game in Dorne. Just to reveal the master plan. It, it just... Ah. Gets me upset. And Jamie and Braun and Dorn. It became like a buddy cop movie. Oh, look at Jamie and Braun and Dorn. You know, they're they're sneaking around and then they're fighting the sand snakes. Oh, for fuck's sake. Even the showrunners, like, the way they just got rid of him, too, was just like, we know we fucked up. Yeah, the so. way they killed Dorn in uh, <laughs> episode one of season six or episode two. It's like, okay, we're, we're going to move on from this. I think just the worst part about it, too, is, like, how great Oberyn was in the show and Pedro Pascal. Like, when I pull my blade, your friend starts bleeding quite a lot, I'm afraid. So many veins in the wrist. That's one thing they got right. Yes, it was so great, and then they just kind of shit on his legacy, kind of. Like. Yeah. Oh, we don't we don't hurt little girls in Dorne. Um, oh, I hated that. And then Alaria Sand. What's the best way to avenge uh, Oberyn? Kill his family. <laughs> they love Marcella in the book. No, they want they want her to be the queen. That's their whole. That's their plan B. Their plan A is to marry their oldest son Quentin to Daenerys. But he's nowhere to be found. He's replaced with Tristane, who gets stabbed through the fucking eye. So great, great job, D and D. Oh, I'm gonna get pissed at and them. Ariel Hotan. Oh, every, I'm every gonna day. get pissed as this list goes on. You're a greedy bitch, you know that? This is a character that had great potential as a villain because in the books, he's one of those characters that he's very mysterious. Nobody knows where he's been for the entire series. And then he kind of just shows up and he kills Balon Greyjoy. And he does that in the books. He's probably in the show for an episode where he takes the throne and then he's like, let's go kill my niece and nephew. It's similar to Dorne where all the politicking, all the infighting for the Sea Stone chair, completely disregarded. For one scene, there was like seven people fighting for the throne for the Sea Stone chair. I wish about that. Like Victorian's such a great character too, so they kind of combined him with Euron. But Euron isn't doesn't look and seem like someone that you could took Euron and Victorian and put them together, created the super great joy. He's kind of just like no, he kind of shows up, makes a couple of dick jokes, and he's like, I'm the king. In the books, there's you know there hasn't been a king smoot for hundreds of years. There's never been a queen. The dragon horn. That's one of the things that we think they're going to just disregard. Even in the books, we don't know if it works. But it would have been so cool if they introduced this earlier. That would have been a real threat it gives to Daenerys. A, yeah, it gives him a fighting chance. Now we just think, like, oh, it's another guy who's going to get smoked by the fucking dragons. He may win a battle or two in the sea, but who cares? Yeah, right. Who cares? Nobody cares about this character. It's They should have just left him. The House of the Undying change, it's the one change where I think it was handled very well in the show for the budget, for the time. You couldn't have done all that happened in the House of the Undying on TV, but I wish they would have done more. The visions that she experiences, Daenerys, 
they're so important to the future of the show. There's there's so many things that happen in the House of the Undying that we could have went back and said, oh, that was a little bit of foreshadowing, and even things that haven't come yet. So I think Quarth was saw Quarth. a little bit of it. Uh, Quarth, Carth, Quarth, the greatest city that ever was. Yeah, uh, I think Quarth. they were both kind of dull in both the show and the books. The House of the Undying is something that fans still look back to to make their theories for the books. And it's it's great because there's just so much there. It adds some depth. You see you see a little bit of Rhaegar. You see a little bit of Rob. You see, you know. Yeah, she things, sees the Red Wedding. Things Daenerys has no business seeing being foreshadowed. She even sees a vision of her father telling everybody to burn down the Red Keep. She sees a vision of a blue flower that kind of indicates the true parentage of Jon Snow. In the show, they don't really hint at who Jon Snow's parents are. So this could have been a great moment of foreshadowing where people could have looked back on and said, Oh, okay, that's what that meant. It's I mean, it's cool you get to see, like, Jason Momoa again as Cal Drogo, but... Yeah, that was cool. In the show in general, like, the whole course is just kind of... It was very dull. Now, this is probably one of my more, like, nitpicky ones, but I think it still deserves to be mentioned, because the way... The John's death in the books, I feel, was just a wave of emotions, and it was just spectacularly written. Yeah, because I think you have more of the build-up in the books with all the negotiations that he's doing with the Wildling, and when he gets the letter from Ramsay Snow, and there's also a hint of doubt of what happened to Stannis in the books. In the show, we know that Stannis died. I think the pink letter in the show was good, too. Well, you don't know if it's from Mance or Stannis or right. Ramsay in the books. and In the show, we kind of knew how he was going to come back and that he was eventually going to fight Ramsay. In the books, it's all up in the air. Who knows what's going to happen? I mean, just the wave of emotions. He gets this twisted letter from, well, let's assume it's Ramsay, but it's really open-ended. The whole writing, it's fucking gut-wrenching. It's fucking disturbing. It, but it gets you, it gets John like, excited. It gets the reader excited. So John's ready to go south. He's finally going south to try to take Winterfell. And he gets some wildlings going. There's ruckus going on. There's chaos at the wall right now. No one knows what's going on. And then out of nowhere, he just gets stabbed to death. It's smoked, yeah. The better, it was so much better. Like his brothers were crying. It wasn't like a coup. Like to, you could tell it hurt his brothers to kill him. It wasn't. Yeah, you could see where they're coming from. You know, Night's Watch had been fighting the wildlings for thousands of years. This was a controversial decision. But it's not as hate-filled. Right. They're crying. Right. It's like we have to do it. It's for the watch. And then the final word. <laughs> has to be ghost. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. That well, that's going to be uh, number four. And we'll address that in number four. To me, I can understand why the show didn't make all the Starks wargs, because I think it would have been more confusing. And I think it makes Bran more unique. It gives him that specific magical power. But I can also understand why all the Starks should have been wargs, specifically for Jon. The way that Jon is going to return in the books is incredibly clever. The way that George has devised this, that he has this, this white direwolf, he names him Ghost. And people believe that he warged into Ghost, and that's how he's going to come back. That they're going to fix his mm. body, and then he can warg back into Jon. Yeah, and I which think is incredible. Yeah, it's mind blowing. It's, it's amazing, and I think like the best thing about it in the books too is that it's not no one. They're not all. You see Rob conflicting with himself. Rob has a very strong conviction. He has to remind himself that he's not a wolf. Like he, that's, he says that I think a couple. So in the, um, so in the books, all the Starks are works. Wow, that's incredible. That man, I need to get start reading this damn books, man. Anybody want to buy them for me? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, I'm, I've already ordered the books. <laughs> I need to get the books. Uh, yeah, I do need to get the books, though, and <laughs> start reading them. I was going to do the, um, I was going to do the audio books, um, but I said, let me get the paperbacks. So I'm getting the paperbacks. Um, but hey, if any one of y'all want to throw in a couple of dollars, <laughs> I just get it, guys. Just kidding. All right. I'm just kidding. Don't take me seriously. Multiple times, but no one knows like that's what he means. But he, you could tell that he's been having these dreams and that he's been conflicted. Arya has the wolf dreams. She's the one that pulls out her mother from the river <laughs> through Nymeria. And I don't think she 100% knows what's going on either. But then you get the, through the dreams, you get the wolf pack and how there's Nymeria is leading this massive wolf pack through <laughs> Westeros. And it's very subtle, but with John, like John figuring it out is awesome. They're not as strong as Bran, but to have that connection, and they still have the connection in the show, but not to that extent. You think if there was one character that they should have kept him a warg, it would be John. 
yeah. just, just keep John Award, but he's he's kind of not. He doesn't really know how to control it, like you said. This is another change that I can understand because I'm not the biggest Lady Stoneheart fan in the books because I think it does take away from the Red Wedding. I think it makes it less impactful because she just returns. But George, I think George was trying to show how revenge can turn people into monsters. Well, it's a totally different character from Catelyn, so I don't think it takes away hey, from that much. You guys told me about Lady it's Stoneheart. It's not Catelyn. It's Lady Stoneheart. There's just so much mystery surrounding that, like how much of Catelyn's left. What is she going to do when she sees her children and they see her like this and she just is on this murderous rampage to kill anyone that had anything to do with the Red Wedding? There's a lot of theories, too, that she's working with a couple of people in the North, maybe Howland Reed, to sit John on the throne because Catelyn was one of the people that was witness to Rob's will that made John the heir to Winterfell. It also would have been really cool visually just to see a fucking crazy zombie just beasting on everybody in the show. The reveal would have been amazing for people who didn't know it was coming. Right. I'd rather have that fall on Lady Stoneheart as just uh, having that fall on her than giving it to Arya or Sansa having to take up that moniker because... It's, a, it's never going to be the same. It's not going to be the same, but also, like, I don't, you don't want to put that on Arya or Sansa either, just to become vicious, ruthless. You'd rather have it, all right, give it to Catelyn, and then let Arya and Sansa, they still can be vengeful and seek revenge, but not to the extent that Lady Stoneheart does. Yeah, because she's a nut. And it ends with such a great uh, cliffhanger, too, with uh, Jamie and Brienne. I guess she was on the contract, but she did not have to be in Well, I think it's, it's her arc suffered because they didn't include Lady Stoneheart. That The Lady Stoneheart cliffhanger at the end of Feast for Crows, where she gives Brienne a choice. You can go kill Jamie for me, or you can hang. She has to choose um, the person that I made this vow to or the person that I love. In season five, what does she do? She kind of sits around and looks at a candle, looks at a window. It's like... I think I think the biggest part of the change <laughs> is not having that payoff with uh, Lady Stoneheart because really in the book she doesn't do much either. She's just and looking then around she left for one second. With Podrick, she's face. really she's really not doing much. But the payoff with the Lady Lady Stoneheart stuff that sets up something even better in which the show will never see. They just decided to I guess fast forward Brienne's arc past the Lady Stoneheart or just a completely different storyline. And in season five, I mean, you couldn't think of anything for her to do than to rather sit by a light all season and then miraculously find Stannis in the middle of a battle and kill him. La I think it was just lazy. She's not the only character to suffer in season five. I, I just don't know what D&D &D were thinking with this. I mean, it kind of dumbs down Littlefinger. It puts Sansa in a situation where she spent all these seasons being tormented by Joffrey. They finally get her away with that. She's finally being built up. She's understanding the game. She's becoming confident. She looks like a completely new character when she dyes her hair black. And then they go and marry her to Ramsay Bolton. You can't even talk about what happened to her in that season because it's so disturbing and controversial. I, I just, I don't, I don't understand it. It's, uh, I remember I said Dorn was, I think this is the worst change. Probably, the, yeah. It's, it's, it makes no sense. It really doesn't because I understand like you're trying to build Ramsey up as evil, but you don't have to do that. You know he's evil already from what we've seen with Theon. We've seen enough. That's and true. This doesn't make him seem more evil. This was just, but the arc stance has been on like, place. like you said with Joffrey, I, like how she's I don't know, like as a, as a person that only watched the TV show. As a person that only watched the TV show, I don't know if I agree with them. I think this is one of the best things about that happened in the show. Um, not that I agree with what happened or I, you know, I wished it up on Sansa or anything like that. It's just that it showed, it built him up a lot more. And as I said, I don't know what happened in the book. With Ramsey, I don't know what was the difference. You guys can let me know what happened in the comment section. I don't know if they're going to discuss it here. Um, but that was one of the main things that I looked at and I, uh, uh, that, that I looked at and I was like, hey, her coming out of this even worse situation. Because what happened between her and Ramsey? Er, she escaped being raped. She was slapped around in King's Landing treated bad by Joffrey, even almost gotten killed, you know, by that douchebag that, that kept slapping her around when that King's guard, I don't remember his name. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember his name, but I can't remember. Anyways. Yeah. That really 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 that when you th this is the reason why you have you know people that really love Sansa's character now 
in the show is because of that. Sansa never really seemed like she was learning anything. Let's be honest about it. Until she got married to Ramsay and got out of that. Up until then, the first time we see some something of that was when she lied for Littlefinger. That was the first time when I was saying that, you know, when she was coming down the steps, her hair dyed black, and I was like, oh, you got that Cersei swagger now. That she was walking like she was Cersei, you know what I'm saying? Like that majestic walk, like the confidence now. You're showing the confidence, but at the same time, she was still very manipulative. At, um, she was still being manipulated by Littlefinger. So she was learning from Littlefinger, but she was eating up everything that Littlefinger was was, was trying to, what was telling her. She was listening to him. She was taking his word as medicine. You get what I'm saying? So it was like, to me, she was not independent until she got out of the Ramsey relationship and her finding it in him in herself. She got back with John. She realized that, listen, I was an asshole to you as a child. And now we got to understand we're brothers and sisters. We need to take back our home and all this stuff. That's really when we saw the real Sansa come out, the educated Sansa, the, the woman that wants to be on top, the girl that I said out of everybody in the show that I would want to see on at still this moment, I still say I would love to see Sansa on the Iron Throne because I think she would do a very good job as a queen of Westeros. I really do believe that. So, um, so for me, it's just like I think that was very pivotal. I think, in my opinion, just for the TV series and forgetting what happened in the books, I believe that that's one of the best things to ever happen um in the show as as a situation for Sansa to go through um you know it, it's kind of tough for you to be you know for anybody to go through that you know what I'm saying being a virgin and being raped as a virgin that wasn't cool being and being in a marriage that you know that this guy you didn't even know because you because and Littlefinger put her in this situation him for the first, I think this is the only mistake Littlefinger e ever made in the show. It's the only mistake that he made up until they f they figured out, you know, what he was doing and figured out what was happening because of Bran and stuff like that. And he killed him. But at the same time, I do believe that um, that was the only mistake he made up until then. He, he was playing the game perfectly until then. You know what I'm saying? And it was the only bad decision because we know because we saw what he did to Theon. So we was like, what are you doing, bro? You know what I'm saying? That's a, We laying back like, what the hell is this guy doing? Like, we don't expect Littlefinger to put Sansa in that situation because obviously he doesn't know. He, he said it himself in the show that he doesn't know much about Ramsey. So that was bad on his part to not do it. It's the first time I, he never did any research, you know, so that was very weird. But anyways, I, I kind of disagree with this, but as I said, I don't know what happened in the books, but I think this was very, this part of it was very pivotal for Sansa's character. You know, all through this before, and you finally see her overcoming it in her own with uh, Littlefinger in the veil, and then you just bring her right back down again. It dumbs down the Littlefinger see, character because that swagger he walk, set man. up Sansa perfectly to be in a position to take back Winterfell with, with him supporting her. But in the show, she just completely doesn't trust him anymore because of this miscalculation. In the show, it's kind of like it's over for him. I mean, instead of like finding for something for Sansa to do to help build, like she's already came back in such a strong way and you already seen the start of her learning starting to play play the game a little and instead of adding on to that where you can actually little finger can basically create a monster in a sansa where she's playing the game now she's this new player and she eventually will little finger little finger like right. i think that's something that'll be set a up little in the finger books. little finger just tear her <laughs> down again and i mean even though she did come back strong now she's like helped lead the starks and helped the battle and all that but he could have done that in a much better way she could have done the ex exact same thing and became the real leader by learning from little finger in the veil and another one of my favorite characters in the books and the show he was 
but more so in the books is Barris and Selmy and the way they just kind of the best swordsman of all time. Haven't we He's talked so about great. this enough? Oh, wait, he gets killed by a bunch of rich guys. He's mowed down. Kicked him to the curb. like For for no reason whatsoever. The actor who played Barrison begged them to keep him. And in the books, he's still alive and well. He's, he's leading. Hand, he's hand of the queen. He's yeah. fucking leading the army. He's and They could have kept him and Tyrion. They didn't have to replace his arc for Tyrion. It made no sense. Just keep them both. And he's such like, it's just so sad. Like, <laughs> like he he's finally he made no he says, sense. Like, I want to lead uh, a ruler that's probably the only thing that I'm like, super angry serving. about. Yeah, a ruler that I finally believe in. Yes, and uh, he, I, uh, and his, the there was no reason to kill Daenerys a guy. When he tells None. her about Rhaegar, all the stories, yeah. all the moments that they share, great chemistry together. He was like the father that she never had. At least let him uh, see Daenerys have success. You know, like way too soon. He's a great advisor. It was such a shock kill. It was just for shock value. Like, oh look, another main character died. We have Tyrion, Barriss, Barriss, and Daenerys, oh, and that would have been a squad, a squad. Even if like they change it to him it's dying how you say in it, the bro. pits, because then he's there defending Daenerys. He's not just patrolling and having some guys run up on him and stab him in the alley where he dies like a nobody. Yeah, at least go let him go out with some dignity, like a hero. Give him a saving noble death. Daenerys, exactly. And in the books, he still might die. Yeah, I'm but it's it, I mean, it's going to be handled much better than it was in the show. It was literally like they threw him in a back alley. I mean, we're, we're more invested. We had the point of views with him. Like He's more of a main character by the time uh, Dance with Dragons comes along. He's just generally a good character. Yeah, he's. All, I love Barristan, and I'll never forgive him. I hate the show. I mean, in most <laughs> cases, when the changes happen, you get a little bit either a combining of characters or they kind of keep some basic points of a storyline. This one, they just absolutely cut out completely, and that's Young Griff. Well, to get a little backstory on Young Griff, apparently Young Griff is Aegon Targaryen, Rhaegar's son. During the sack of King's Landing, Varys saved him, and they shipped him off into exile. They put him under the protection of John Connington, which was Rhaegar's best friend, and they're kind of building him up to return to the Seven Kingdoms to take back the Iron Throne for his family. But then, in turn, there's another theory. There's a theory that he's not Aegon, that he's actually a Blackfire. The exclusion of Young Griff, it takes away from the Varys character, because it kind of makes Varys' motivations unclear. They contradict themselves. Yeah, I would say that's the biggest point. Like, I, I'm okay with the Young Griff storyline in the books. I know some people don't love it, some people do. You're exactly right. It adds to Varys. If it does turn out that he's had this plan all along, and he actually making sure that he would actually be a good king, had the close eye on him, surrounded with people that he knew would raise him right. He was essentially the pet project of Varys and Illyrio. Yeah, so it makes more sense for him to invest the whole country on him rather than Viserys or Daenerys. Because in the show, Varys is kind of like, oh, peace, I just want peace, but I'm going to destroy everything. <laughs> if, if he has a personal motivation, if he's connected to Aegon, if Varys is in fact a Blackfire himself, then it makes more sense that he would have these motivations. In the show, excluding this, it kind of weakens the character of Varys. Another thing, too, is I guess we talked to my, talk all day about how much Dorne sucked, but it also, in Dorne, this is part of their plan as well. They adjust when they send Ariane to meet this Targaryen. Is he a pretender or is he not? And it just. It I just, think we can both assume he's a Blackfire. I, at first, I'm, I was very reluctant, very reluctant to like. Oh, God, think you hated that. it. But now I, I like it even more because if Varys is Blackfire, too, it makes it more personal for him. So let's, let's bring it down. Illyrio, this is, we think this is Illyrio's son. That Illyrio married the last survivor of the Blackfire line. The Blackfires are descendants of the Targaryens. There's just so much great history with the Blackfire rebellions. I can understand why they excluded it because it's a lot. It's I even people who read the books say this came out of nowhere. In a perfect world, like they could have expanded the show. They've done the best with what they could actually, what was feasible to do. I think the show overall has done a good job of adapting the books. It, it, when you write a book, there's no budget, there's no there's no production costs. You can do anything that you that comes into your head. And a lot of great ideas yep. come into George's head. They just can't put them all on film. I love the show for what it is. I like the books a little bit more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that was that and Yeah, but I agree with that last point you know, that they made to end the video. Um, I've never read the book, so I don't have an opinion about the books. Um, from what I've heard, it sounds awesome. Now, when I read the books, I am not going to say, um, you know, oh, 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 you know, I'm not going to get my, my, my briefs all in a bunch because I'm going to judge them separately. Okay, I'm going to say the show is the show, the books is the books. 
that's how you have to take these things because if you keep on hating what they did and he made a great point and I, I said this multiple times when I was reacting to Game of Thrones and people were talking about the books, the books, the books and I'm saying, listen, there's a lot of things uh, an, uh, an author, when they write in a book, they don't have to worry about jack shit. They can write something that's 10,000 pages long and the publisher will publish it because they know it. The fans are going to buy it. They ain't got to worry about anything. They can take 5,000 pages to explain one character. Okay. In a TV show, they got to worry about so many things. They got to worry about production costs. They got to worry about um, the budget for that. They got they got to worry about um, the the um, the writers that are actually going to write the dialogue for the show. They got to worry about all of these other things. And if the person is not just as brilliant as as George Im George himself, you're not going to get that same feeling. Because yes, he may have approved the scripts and stuff like that, but I'm pretty sure that George sometimes look at it and be like, okay, this can go, this can go, this can go, this can go. Maybe not this, but this can go, this can go, because I know you can't do this, and you can't do this, and you can't do this, but this is okay. This is okay, and this is okay. You get what I'm saying? Because as I said, he's still an EP on the show. He's still an EP up until the end of game is gay. Um, up until the end of season seven, he was still an EP on the show. So I'm pretty sure they weren't just doing whatever they wanted, you know, because that's his masterpiece is his work. So I'm pretty sure that he approved the scripts. So at the end of the day, this is still under his supervision. So in certain terms, you have to, when, when it comes on to a TV show, you have to worry about a lot more things, a whole lot more things than a person writing a book. Okay. And you have to take those things into consideration when you're bashing the TV show. You just have to. There's certain things that I disagree that I felt felt like they could have done more with and extended it and just melt this cow till the come till 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 they come home or how whatever the saying says. You know what I'm saying? It's it's just to me they could have done more. They could have maybe extended the seat the seasons, maybe a couple more episodes, you know, maybe 12 episodes and get some storylines out of the way. But uh, that's one of the things too, where I was like, why they only gave them 10 weeks? You know what I'm saying? In the earlier ones in, in like from season one to season six, it was only 10 episodes per season. You know, HBO could have done more. They could have gave them 12 episodes. I don't know why. Maybe it's the, they had to, to worry about you know, still, and that's what I'm saying, maybe it's, it's a budget thing, you know, it could be that they couldn't afford to do more than 10 hours, you know, they couldn't afford to do more than, more than 10 hours, um, per season, you know, um, I mean, the, the recording, they spend years recording this stuff, so it's, so, I mean, I just appreciate the show for what it is, and I know when I read a book, you know, I'm just going to take the book for what it is and just not going to be a completely new story for me, but it's just going to be a new experience. Just kind of seeing, seeing the whole thing from a different perspective, from, from the actual George perspective, if you want to say that, but man, it has been one hell of a journey. That's all I can say. I didn't agree with them a hundred percent with some with with what they said about some of the changes but it is what it is i've never read read the book maybe if i read if i had read the books i would have had a different opinion maybe i would have agreed with them a hundred percent but i think one of the biggest thing that i disagree with them is um i think that the sansa ramsey marriage was it was a big deal to me. I think she needed that to really, really show who she is right now. I think she needed to go through that for her character. Um, nobody deserves to be raped. Nobody deserves to be treated that way. Um, to be, you know, every night be having sex, not willingly with someone and you can't do shit about it. Like, I don't believe anybody deserves that. Um, 
but as I said, the person who Sansa is now, that is a part of why she is who she is now. Whereas in, and I'm glad she got her revenge. Um, she, she got to watch him die. So that was, that was good. You know what I'm saying? Cause y'all, y'all already know what my reaction is to some of those scenes because it, 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 it was just awesome to see her growing up finally seeing her in a different light. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, in the earlier parts, I didn't like the difference between her and her and her sister. Arya. It was like, you know, she was in a worse situation. You know, Arya was always running. Um, she was always running. She was always trying to survive. Um, Sansa was in the worst situation because she kind of couldn't get out of where she was, you know, when she was there with Joffrey and stuff, she couldn't really get out, you know, but at the same time, you know, I felt like she could have stood up a little bit more sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and, and in certain one time she stood up to Joffrey, but (laughs) <laughs> but it didn't work out well, you know, the hound kind of had to, because she was going to push Joffrey off of that ledge or bridge or whatever, you know what I'm saying, I wanted her to do it too, because they'll be like, oh, she got rid of Joffrey good, you know what I'm saying, hey, at the cost of your head, hey, that's, you, you killed the king, and, and at least would have got rid, got rid of that psychopath, you know what I'm saying, so, but then again, is it's just, they just replace one with the other, because at that point, I don't think Tommen could have taken the throne. I don't think he would have been old enough to take the throne at that point if if Sansa had killed him then. Um, but that's just my opinion. As I said, all opinions are welcome here. You guys can tell me what you think um, about these, these top 10 best and worst changes from the books. If you've read the books, even if you have not read the books, you can still have an opinion. Come at me, bro. Anyways, remember guys, and that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm leaving these videos because I know they're going to be long. Listen, I've been recording for over an hour now and this entire thing <laughs> is going up. So it's going to take a while to upload. Hope you guys watched this, enjoyed it. Thank you guys for watching as always. It's the first time watching, make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell. And also hit that like button, man. Slap it up, beat it up. You know what I'm saying? Um, and leave a comment, of course. Let let me know what you think of these changes. If you read the book, even, or if you have not read the book, you can still have an opinion. Everyone is welcome here at Terabyte Reacts. Okay, so thank you guys for listening. And as always, it's your boy Terabyte Reacts in peace.